for coming this evening. Um, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Dr. Kern from the University of Akron here, because um, he's got lots to say about World War II, and more specifically, about what was going on around here during World War II in Summit County. And I think you were going to cover maybe a little beyond Summit County, but, but definitely Ohio. So I will turn it over, and thank you again, Dr. Kern, for coming and giving us this presentation. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking Denise for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, uh, it's, it's, I was just telling her earlier today, it is genuinely a pleasure to talk to people who are actually interested in history. I can't always say the same for my students at the University of Akron. So thank you. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a treat for me uh, as, uh, as well. Um, my topic today, as, as you've heard, will be uh, Akron and, and World War II, and, and more broadly, uh, Ohio and World War II. Uh, and uh, in order to, before we kind of get started in the war years, I think it's important to understand what was going on in Akron in the years leading up to the war. Uh, the city had been the scene of remarkable growth, uh, Akron had, and remarkable demographic changes just in the decades preceding. Uh, as you can see, uh, in 1900, there were 42,000 people in Akron, but then between 1910 and 1920, the city tripled in size uh, and continued to grow. And this was largely on the back of, of course, the proliferation of the rubber industries uh, in Akron. It was the fastest growing city in the country during the 19-teens. And in fact, there was uh, a, a sleepy town in California that actually published something in their newspaper about how uh, you know, the city fathers of our town wish that uh, our little town could show the kind of growth that Akron's been showing. They're the little town of Los Angeles, California. Uh, the, uh, the city grew from uh, being the 81st to the 32nd largest city just in those, that 10 year period between 1910 and 1920. Of course, this also is uh, when World War I happened. It added yet another small city's worth of population between 1920 and 1930. Uh, the Great Depression did reverse the trend, uh, as you see. People uh, st started moving out of the city, going uh, other places. But World War II then uh, caused a huge economic boom, uh, which put the city's population at 275,000 by 1950. So it, it, it grew and expanded again. So here's one of the effects that World War II uh, had, just right from the very basic demographic standpoint, uh, it, uh, it reversed this negative uh, demographic trend that had been going on in the years of the Depression. Um, and of course, where are these, uh, these people from? Uh, the, during the early period, some of this growth had come from European immigration, particularly Germany, Austria, and Hungary. Uh, these together accounted for about 15,000 of Akron's foreign-born population. Uh, and of course, there was already a substantial foreign-born population, especially Germans in, in Akron before this. Uh, you had also something called the new immigration that happens in the late 1800s, early uh, 1900s uh, from Eastern and Southern Europe. And these, uh, this touched Akron as well. Uh, Italy and Russia were the two largest contributors from that area. Um, but most of Akron's population increase came from the United States outside of Ohio. Uh, if you're looking at where a lot of that growth comes from, as you can see, uh, other places in Ohio contributed a lot. Uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. What do all these things have in common? Does anybody? Appalachia. Appalachia. So all these people from uh, coming in from Appalachia, more than 50,000 people came from internal <coughs> migration, primarily from the Appalachian regions. And the scale of influx from these regions was so great that sometimes uh, people would joke uh, that the correct answer to the question, what is the capital of West Virginia, was Akron, Ohio. 
Uh, this is also, of course, a time marked by the great migration uh, of African Americans from the South to northern cities. And Akron's black population did increase substantially between 1910 and 1945. Uh, Akron's uh, black population in 1910 was 675 people, only 675, and by the war's end it was 23,878. So uh, not only did they, uh, they grow phenomenally, they uh, comprise, African Americans comprised about 9% of Akron's population by the end of the war. So as World War II approached, Akron had a much larger, much more diverse population than it had just a few years earlier during World War I. So uh, Akron goes to war with the uh, rest of the United States. Uh, and of course, one of the first things we think about when we think about uh, World War II are, of course, the men in uniform, the people who actually served. Uh, of the 839,000 Ohioans who served in World War II, more than 31,000 of them registered in, from Akron. They, they enlisted into the armed forces uh, in Akron. Uh, and then they were uh, dispersed through different military units across the globe. Uh, among the most uh, Ohio heavy units in, uh, in World War II uh, was the 37th uh, Division, also known as the Buckeye Division, which was comprised mainly of former Ohio National Guard troops. The 37th fought in uh, the Pacific Campaign uh, the Northern Solomons, uh, especially um, uh, New Georgia and Bougainville, and uh, also uh, in uh, Luzon, in the Philippines. And this division won uh, nine Distinguished Unit Citation and seven Medals of Honor. Uh, other notable units, composed mostly of Ohioans, were Company C of the 192nd Tank Battalion, the 112th Engineer Combat Battalion, and the 174th Field Artillery Battalion. Uh, and uh, the uh, Akron itself uh, contributed three people who were eventually awarded uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest citation any soldier can get. Uh, Harold Glenn Epperson uh, in Saipan, uh, with the six Marines, uh, uh, saw there was a Japanese soldier who everyone thought was dead who then stood up and lobbed a high power grenade uh, at his men and he threw himself on the grenade and saved uh, all of his uh, squad mates. Uh, you also had uh, Howard E. Woodford from uh, Barberton. Uh, he uh, was in Luzon in July of 1945 uh, and was sent to find out why uh, the advance uh, units of an attack uh, had bogged down and he found the, the unit in disarray. It was his first time in combat. Uh, he essentially just took charge. He, he uh, um, sent the wounded to the rear, reorganized the, the troops and then actually exposed himself to uh, uh, hostile fire just to find out where they were firing from. So he'd pop up and they'd start firing and say, okay, shoot over there. Uh, he would call in mortar, call in uh, 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 support. Uh, and uh, he was actually radioed. He'd say, okay, you can come back now. He said, no, these, these people need me here. So he stayed there uh, overnight. And he was wounded uh, by a grenade, but still uh, grabbed his rifle and uh, led uh, a group against uh, uh, in kind of the... Uh, the, the pickets that were uh, set there uh, over the night and, and the, the Japanese picked that night to launch a suicide attack and uh, when he was found the next morning he was found in his uh, in his foxhole dead but there were 37 of the enemy uh, around him that he had uh, he had taken out before he, he perished. Uh, perhaps the most famous Akron Area Medal of Honor recipient is Addison Earl Baker, who was the group commander of the 93rd Heavy uh, Bombardment Group. Uh, those of you who are World War II aficionados may remember uh, learning about the air raid on Ploiesti in Romania uh, in 1943. Uh, the Germans uh, were, they, this is before the United States had actually gotten into the European uh, theater. 
uh, but they were trying to, t to degrade uh, the Nazi ability to prosecute the war. And one of the big things they could do was take out their oil refining capacity. There was huge uh, oil refining uh, going on in Pluisti, and uh, uh, Addison Barker, Baker uh, led this, um, uh, this group uh, to Pluisti, and he was in the, he was leading a formation and it was hit very heavily by anti-aircraft fire. His plane caught on fire, uh, but he felt that he really needed to continue to lead uh, the mission because he was, uh, and so even though they were on fire, he, he got to his target, he dropped his bombs, uh, and then uh, tried to get enough altitude to uh, allow his men a chance to uh, bail out, um, uh, but was, was unable to. But he was able to steer his plane away from running into other planes that were arriving just at that time. Uh, and like I said, he is probably the most famous of all the Medal of Honor uh, recipients from this area. Um, of course, most people in Ohio, most people in Akron, did not experience the war on the front lines. Instead, they were profoundly touched by the war and contributed to the war effort right here at home. And of course, during the war, this is one of the biggest contributions that Ohio made uh, in terms of industry. Ohio ranked fourth in the amount of money that was received by U.S. government defense contracts, a total of $18 million. Uh, these contracts benefited Akron to the tune of about $2.1 billion, and uh, its major industries contributed mightily to the war effort. Akron's main contribution, of course, was uh, rubber production, and all of this activity increased the growing connectedness between business national defense, and universities. This was most apparent in the race to create a substitute for raw rubber, which was a natural resource that came primarily from Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific Islands. As the Japanese took over large chunks of this area, they came to control 90% of the world's supply of this crucial commodity. Uh, and at one point in the war, the U.S only had a three-week supply of rubber left. It was one of the most crucial, dire situations in terms of supply in the entire war. But by drawing together scientists, military leaders, industrial managers, and of course government officials, uh, the synthetic rubber program that uh, began in 1942, uh, if it hadn't been for those show-offs at Los Alamos, who blew up that big atomic bomb, this probably would have been recognized as the most uh, transformative scientific uh, and technological accomplishment of the war. And it was, it was very much like the Manhattan Project in terms of the degree of resources that were put into it and the number of experts that were called in to, uh, to participate in this. Uh, the amount of rubber needed for wartime was immense. One battleship, I mean, we think of tires, right? Yes, and there's tires, but one battleship alone required 75 tons of rubber, just one battleship. Without rubber, it would have come to a halt. The, the war production would have come to a halt. According to the Baruch Committee, which was convened uh, to review the situation, and I'm quoting uh, here, it says, if we fail to secure quickly a new large rubber supply, our war effort and our domestic economy both will collapse. So it was a really dire situation. And Akron was at the center of this national effort with tire company personnel involved and the University of Akron playing an important administrative and scientific role. The university administered over $8 million in government funds, and Akron's tire companies received millions of dollars to fund research as well. And the result was something called the GRS synthetic rubber, or government rubber styrene. Uh, this was a, a, a joint project of uh, not just uh, University of Akron, also uh, the uh, Case Institute of Technology, which is part of uh, Case Western Reserve University, 
uh, but also the main rubber companies. And those of you who, who remember uh, when the rubber companies were very active, you remember they, there was a really healthy rivalry between you know, the Goodyears and the Goodriches and the Firestones, right? And one of the only times when they all kind of joined hands and worked together was mm -hmm. World War II. They shared over 200 patents with each other. This was unheard of. You know, when you're a business, you keep the patents to yourself and you try to keep other people from getting them. No, they opened up, they, uh, they shared uh, uh, Goodrich and Goodyear and, and Firestone all worked together uh, on this. Uh, more than 200 uh, patents, the findings of more than 200 patents. Uh, and uh, and they, they succeeded. It was one of the greatest industrial production accomplishments of the war by the United States. Uh, before the war, in 1941, on all of 1941, the United States produced 231 tons of synthetic rubber. By 1945, they produced 920,000 tons. In fact, some months they were producing 70,000 tons a month. Uh, and this is one of the key uh, things that helped the war machine go. And of course, not just for the United States military, but for all the allies. But of course, rubber is not the only thing that Akron plants were producing for the war effort. Uh, Firestone produced artillery shells, metal containers, uh, anti-aircraft mounts. Goodyear, of course, went even further uh, as a person who teaches at the University of Akron, uh, I think I'm contractually obligated to show a picture of a blimp at some point. Uh, so this is as good a place as any. Not only did Goodyear's iconic blimps play a key role in reconnaissance, uh, and especially for uh, leading convoys uh, uh, across the North Atlantic, uh, they were used as scouts for, uh, to find submarine uh, and submarine wolf packs. Uh, they were also used as barrage balloons. Barrage balloons were uh, balloons that were uh, kind of tied up to high, um, high very sensitive military uh, installations to keep strafing runs from, uh, uh, from uh, being successful. Uh, it also built uh, gas tanks for the B-6 bombers uh, and, of course, built its own aircraft manufacturing plants. Its biggest contribution was uh, the B-26 Marauder and the FG-1 Corsair aircraft that play key roles in the air war. Some people uh, regard the Marauder as the best light bomber of the entire war, of um, any side. Uh, and of course, it was not just used by the United States, but also by the British, the South African, and the Free French Air Forces. And because of the huge demand for these Marauders, the Glen L. Martin Company that originally made the Marauder subcontracted out significant parts of its production, including things like wings and fuel tanks, to the Goodyear Aviation Division. These planes saw action in the Southwest Pacific and in the Mediterranean theories, but, theaters, but primarily against the Germans in Western Europe. By the end of the war, the more than 5,000 marauders produced saw, uh, had flown more than 110,000 sorties and dropped 150,000 tons of bombs, all while having the lowest combat loss rate of any aircraft during the war. Uh, it's a, a, a staggering accomplishment. Uh, the Corsair was uh, one of the best carrier-based fighter-bomber aircrafts of the war. It was used extensively through the Pacific uh, by the Navy, but primarily by the Marines. Its wings were able to fold up uh, for easier storage below the decks of carriers, but it had an unfortunate um, habit of bouncing a little too much, so it didn't catch the tail hook on the carrier. Uh, so they had to do some tweaking. Also, it was hard to land because of this very long nose. They called it the hose nose sometimes. Uh, and uh, the, the, the bubble uh, here did not allow for very good visibility. So they had to make some adjustments to it so it was easier to, uh, to uh, uh, land on aircraft. Only about 15% of the sorties of the Corsair were uh, from aircraft carriers. But the Marines uh, made very, very heavy uh, use of, of these things. And uh, the pilots who flew them, and it was a kind of steep learning curve. It, the, the Corsair uh, apparently was one of the harder planes to, to master. But once you mastered it, 
pilots found that their speed and power were superior to anything the Japanese uh, had uh, in almost every respect. Uh, Marine General Gregory Pappy Boynton's famous Black Sheep Squadron used Corsairs in the Solomon Islands and they were in heavy use until the end of the war as both fighters and fighter bombers. Now I'm informed that uh, those of you who remember Baba Black Sheep, the old uh, yeah. TV show, I've just been informed it's back on the air on a, on a network called MeTV on 5 o'clock on Sunday, so if you wanted to catch that. Uh, and uh, Faith Burnett from the uh, MAPS Museum has a little uh, anecdote about uh, Pappy Boynton, which uh, she wants to share with you here. Um, learned about this story about five or six years ago. That when um, Pappy learned how to tell the, where the different Corsairs were built, which plant that they were built in, by looking at their ribbons. And Akron used the highest quality materials that were the highest grade, um, whereas other plants would use anywhere from medium to low, the lower end of the grade. And um, he, he learned from being in some of these lower grade planes that the rivets would pop out. <laughs> and a couple of times he went in the drink. <laughs> And so anytime he, they brought new Corsairs to Bella La Cava, um, they, he would immediately look at the rivets, and if they were from those plants with the lower grade materials, he'd get, he'd say, get these pieces of SH <laughs> out of here, get me the apple. Oh, my boys aren't flying in those. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another, uh, another, I did not know that. Thank you, Faith. I appreciate that. Uh, and of course, like I said, the Corsairs were, were uh, very much loved by the pilots that flew them. They, clo they flew close to half of all the fighter sorties in the Pacific during World War II, about 44%. And they racked up a kill ratio of more than 11 to 1 against Japanese aircraft. Uh, and so, uh, and the, the Akron, Akron plants made about a third of them. I just want to make a quick comment about riveting. Uh, my sister was a riveter, and her name happened to be Rose. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're actually just going to be talking about that. Uh, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the workers and these, uh, these, air def uh, these, these defense plants. Um, the Akron War Industries provided enormous opportunities for employment. Unemployment in Akron virtually ended uh, during the war and, and in many other industrial cities around the United States as production expanded, even as millions of people, millions of men left the workforce to, uh, to go into uniform. Coal production increased 82%. Industrial wages went up about 65%. And farm income went up by nearly 200 percent. The number of workers in Ohio's basic industries increased from uh, about three quarters of a million to uh, one and a quarter million. In 1939, 33,000 uh, people worked in Akron's rubber plants. By 1944, 72,890. So more than doubling the previous number. The aircraft division at Goodyear was hiring 1,000 people a month for a while in 1942, topping out at 33,000 people overall. The federal government also created weapons manufacturing plants in Ravenna, and of course the Ravenna Arsenal, uh, outside Columbus, Toledo, and, and other cities. Uh, the iconic Jeep, we associate the Jeep with, uh, with World War II, that came into being at the Toledo Willis Overland uh, plant, using Ak Akron rubber, of course, for tires, hoses, and windshield wipers. Uh, so, with so many men serving in the military, industrial labor was at a premium, and factories began hiring from some groups that had been underrepresented in the past. Uh, for example, deaf people. Deaf people often had trouble finding work before the war because of their disability. 
but uh, the Akron Rubber Companies found that in certain jobs they were perfect uh, for this. Actually, not being able to hear when you have all kinds of noise going on made them uh, ideal for certain parts of the plant. Uh, by mid-1943, Firestone had about 300 deaf workers and Goodyear had about 135. And the Goodyear Aircraft Division had more than 500. The most significant change in the labor situation, however, regarded women and African Americans. The government propaganda campaign aimed at women in the home uh, used a variety of means to attract women into the workforce, including posters with the iconic Rosie the Riveter image, which, I don't know, is this, uh, is this year? Uh, they're, they're, uh, I think they might be working on I don't know. <coughs> um, and, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, of the oh. In the past well, yeah. that is uh, it's happening with a lot of frequency as uh, as, as time passes, of course, uh, and that's that's why a lot of uh, people, especially at people at the University of Akron, do oral history, like to collect oral histories from uh, from from people from from that time. Um, Women comprise about 30% of all industrial workers in Ohio. Employers placed women mainly in a variety of semi-skilled positions, including the manufacture of parts, munitions, and electronics. Uh, in Akron, women entered the rubber plants to make various products, including pontoons, life rafts, and tires. There's a wonderful book on this called Rosie the Rubber Worker by uh, Kathleen Endress, if any of you are interested in, in reading more about Rosie the Rubber Worker. Uh, cities employing women offered some assistance. Women with children often worked at night in the night shift, and so you saw public and private daycare centers emerging. Shopping hours were extended to allow these Rosie the Riveters to be able to shop after their shift was over, because uh, married women were still expected to take care of the home while they were working. Uh, single women found that city life was actually very empowering for them. This is uh, a degree of economic freedom that most uh, women had never had before. Uh, wages uh, allowed them to uh, go out and do more things than they were ever able to do before, uh, see more kinds of entertainment than they were able to before, and just generally have more social freedom. Uh, while opportunities did emerge from this, it should be remembered that women generally were paid less than men, and many unions refused to allow them to join. Although they were often not greeted very warmly on the shop floor, uh, women often found the work liberating economically and socially. And of course they knew they were helping out the war effort uh, by providing necessities to their husbands, sons, and brothers who were fighting uh, overseas. Uh, and uh, they often, uh, you, when you, when you uh, read interviews from these women. They'll often talk about how, you know, whenever I started getting a little bored at work, I was remembering, well, these are the things that are going to help our men overseas and, and, and gave them uh, more attention to the task at hand. There's no better example of all this that can be found than the case of Akron resident Navy seaman Elgin Staples. Elgin Staples was serving the Pacific. His boat was sunk by the Japanese at Guadalcanal. But he survived because he had a life belt. And once he got fished out, he looked at the life belt that had kept him afloat in the water, and he found that it had been made at Firestone, where his mother worked. And his mother had been the inspector of that life belt. So that is the famous life belt uh, that she actually inspected. What are the odds, right? Um, African American women found it more difficult than their white counterparts to gain access to industrial jobs. One exception was that they did manage to uh, obtain work in Akron's rubber industries alongside white women. That wasn't necessarily the case in a lot of other places. So, for example, you look at this Corsair picture. Um, most of the workers here, are, but you can see there are a couple of African American women here too. Oftentimes, uh, African American workers were, were kept segregated even on the shop floor. In the Akron Rubber Companies, that was not the case. Um, for their part, um, African Americans uh, serving in these war industries experienced 
ambivalent messages uh, during or just after the war. Their labor was very much needed, uh, but uh, oftentimes they were discriminated against when they sought work in defense plants. Uh, but unlike earlier times, the, the federal government actually did uh, come in to uh, respond to the second class treatment. President Roosevelt issued something called Executive Order 8802, which prohibited discrimination in defense related plants and created Federal Fair Employment Practices Commissions to investigate complaints. So not since Reconstruction had the federal government taken such a forthright stance on racial equality. Uh, even so, even with Executive Order 8802 though, uh, enforcement was sometimes uneven and the level of discrimination did vary from place to place. Uh, oftentimes African Americans found themselves uh, hired last, given the most dangerous unskilled jobs, or uh, ones that are tradi were traditionally associated with them such as cooks and janitors. Uh, unions also continued to discriminate against African Americans, although the CIO did make an effort at some plants to organize African Americans. But despite these injustices, African Americans came to Ohio and seized the opportunities that, that were open to them. By 1950, African Americans would make up 6.5% of Ohio's total population uh, and uh, over half a million, and they would be concentrated primarily in the cities, especially Cleveland, where about 28% of all black Ohioans lived. Um, as for women, for African Americans in World War II, the experience would prove to be a watershed. In the years that follow, uh, blacks would use the experience to build a powerful foundation for the post-war civil rights movement. While the wages workers earned were relatively good, industrial work had always been fraught with dangers and tensions, which the war exacerbated. Plants ran all day, every day. Housing shortages, rationing, the stress from military deployments strained workers and their families. Divorce rates increased. Unions and business owners pledged to keep the peace for the war effort. Uh, business did reap enormous profits, while unions did gain members and saw higher wages and benefits uh, going to those who could join. Still, the tensions allowed for work stoppages and, in some cases, outright strikes. By 1943, Ohio workers were involved in 467 work stoppages. On some occasions, military officers had to step in to keep the peace. Still, organized labor gained in terms of men membership so that by 1945, when the war ended, some 36% of all workers in Ohio were unionized. Uh, let's turn then to uh, what's going on. We're talking the home front. Well, there's the production, there's industry, there's work. But let's turn to the actual home itself. Uh, because this is where most Ohioans, most Akronites, experience the war in their own homes. Even with the extra money that Akron workers are bringing home, there was only so much they could do with the money. <clears throat> Rationing was, of course, a fact of life during World War II, and each family was only allotted a certain amount of each commodity on a regular basis. Uh, you had something called the Office of Price Administration, which gave out to every family in America blue points for processed foods and red points for things like meats and fats and oils. Uh, so here, if you go to the, uh, the price case, it, it shows not just the price, 61 cents, but also how many points you had to spend. So you had to get both the points and the money. A uh, person needed a certain number, a certain amount of uh, certain kinds of stamps along with their money in order to purchase an item. Four B stamps, for example, uh, would get you a pound of ground beef. Five A stamps would get you a bag of sugar. So unless a person resorted to going to the black market, the ration stamps were in many cases more important than the money in acquiring what people wanted. For this reason, it was important to squeeze every little point available. So if the point value of your stamps exceeded the amount you needed to buy something, the clerk would give you red or blue tokens in exchange, which you could then save up uh, for your next shopping trip. And uh, you still see these uh, little red and blue uh, uh, um, tokens uh, in, in coin shops and, and antique stores. Uh, um, they were made out of a, it was kind of a, it wasn't metal, it was a, a kind of plastic um, that was pressed uh, 
sometimes. What? Like, kind of, it was like, I don't know. Anyway, it was, yeah, you don't remember those? Yeah, my mom had, I remember my mom had a little basket that she had, she had set, saved those up with. Um, of course, the rationing uh, did not just extend to food, it also extended to gasoline, and gasoline was especially limited. Most Akrons, uh, most Akronites would get an A sticker, which allowed them only four gallons of gasoline a week. Now, if you got a B sticker, uh, you were deemed essential to the war effort. So this included actually many Akron rubber workers and Akron aircraft employees. They were deemed essential to the war effort, so they were able sometimes to get these B stickers, uh, and you could get eight gallons of gas a week. The C sticker went to people who had to do a lot of traveling, people like doctors and ministers and mailmen, railroad workers. Uh, you also, there was another sticker, I don't have an example there, of the T, which was for truckers. Uh, and perhaps most ironically of all, for people working in the Akron rubber factories, the most highly rationed and nearly impossible item to get legally were? Well, nylon stockings, but tires. People working in the Akron rubber plants could not get tires. Uh, no domestic tires were available to the public for the duration, and they put patches on top of patches, and, and they were just <laughs> tires by the end of the war were these big donuts with, uh, 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 with, with hardly any tread left on them oftentimes. Uh, so that was one of the most highly rationed items during the war. Um, one way in which you can see how these straightened conditions, affected acronites especially, can be found in something called the Glennis Snow Cookbook. This was compiled by the home economics editor of the Akron Beacon Journal. Ac uh, American families, uh, of course, had been forced, since the times of the Depression, actually, to squeeze the most out of the resources that they had at hand, from stretching dollars to stretching food. Although a few examples of this in the Glenna Snow cookbook could be clearer than the recipes that she provided for such items as war cake, economical cake, economical gingerbread, or economy oatmeal cookies, all of which are uh, recipes that you can find in Glenna Snow's cookbook. This cookbook is replete with other unambiguous references to the types of constraints under which Akron's homemakers had to operate. Some of the clearest evidence of these kinds of restrictions can be found in the ingredients that the book suggests for use. The most economical ingredient, of course, is one that costs nothing at all. And there are several recipes uh, devoted for such items. A ingredient, some may say, a lamentably ubiquitous free ingredient was literally at Akronite's doorsteps Dandelions. Dandelions actually show up several times throughout the book as canned greens, as cooked greens, two ways. Mock mushrooms um, to be made out of dandelions or dandelion wine, all of which uh, can be found in the Glen of Snow cookbook. For those who are willing to do, go a little farther to forage than their front lawn, the book also provides two recipes for crab apple jelly with the implicit assumption that these could be easily gathered from the ordinarily commercially useless crab apple trees that used to be found with some frequency around the area. Similarly, one of the many helpful hints that Snow throws in as a filler throughout the book states, and I'm quoting here, since elderberries grow by the roadside, they are always free for the picking. The blossoms are especially good for wine. The book elsewhere gives recipes for cobbler, jam, jelly, and preserves made from uh, elderberries as well as elderberry blossom fritters, which actually I would like to try sometime. <laughs> for even more committed foragers, there are several pages of recipes for game animals, including several preparations for rabbit, and one for the most plentiful game animal in Akron. Anyone want to guess what that is? Squirrels. 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 Uh, in fact, two whole pages are devoted to squirrel recipes, and if you wanted to stock up for the winter, there are also instructions on how to can squirrel meat. <laughs> Whatever they use, BB guns or uh, uh, traps or uh, 
club over the head. I don't know. Set the dog on him. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, most by BB guns. You could, you could get. Uh, they could use BB guns, but yeah, the BBs themselves sometimes were were, were hard to find. Uh, the Glenna Snow cookbook uh, frequently addresses the issue of making the most uh, of food that the family did not finish in previous meals, not only incidentally. For she says at one point, croquettes are a good method of using up leftover materials. But she also provides a four-page section devoted entirely to, entirely to repurposing leftover food. Helpfully alph alphabetized by the food, one can find a second life for almost any kind of food described in the book, including bean sandwiches, and brain patties. Mm -mm. Uh, Snow also includes many recipes that seem to refer to more specifically to wartime rationing. There are a number of recipes that actually advertise the limited amount of the ration ingredients in their names, including sugarless brownies, one egg cakes, and butterless, eggless, milkless cake. Furthermore, Snow devotes an entire section to substitutes and extenders, which includes instructions on how to stretch or replace butter using margarine, fat, lard, milk, cream, or gelatin, sugar using molasses, maple syrup, corn syrup, or honey, coffee using roasted whole grain wheat, and in, in an instance of a substitute for a substitute, synthetic maple syrup using boiled corn cobs and brown sugar. Uh, the section also has handy charts for making the transition between ingredients, giving equivalents and standard measures, and warning about the different properties between, for example, cake flour and bread flour. Elsewhere, she lists a, a, a long list of meat substitutes using carrots, cheese, rice, nuts, and soybeans as meat substitutes. Sprinkled throughout the rest of the text are a number of mock recipes, including mock chicken a la king. Anyone want to guess? Tuna. Squirrel. squirrel. Yeah, maybe, maybe squirrel. <laughs> Tastes like chicken, I hear. Um, mock sausage. You'll never guess it. Lima beans. And mock whipped cream using egg whites and applesauce. Although Snow states in her introduction that these have been added because of the war, she also supposed they would be used universally from now on. There are often in peacetimes occasions which require that we use another ingredient rather than one called for in the recipe. Uh, how many people have tried that since the, the brain patties? Anyone? Okay, no. <laughs> Furthermore, scarcity did not apply only to foods and ingredients, but to other important kitchen supplies. Pressure cookers, for example, had become widely available to most American homes in the late 1930s, but the conversion to wartime industrial footing ended the production of these coveted items for private use. So you couldn't buy a pressure cooker. They weren't making them anymore. So while Snow strongly recommends the use of pressure cookers in her canning section, she also acknowledges on more than one occasion either that few were available or that many readers were unable to get them and provides alternative methods for canning without them. Uh, Snow's discussion of uh, canning uh, points to another major factor of life on the home front, home food production. And nearly 88 pages, almost 20% of the book's content, it is by far the longest section of the book. By the 1930s and 40s, canning had made tremendous advances and American homemakers were doing it more than ever before. The government encouraged American households to grow both victory gardens and to can the surplus to allow more of the nation's food production, as well as the tin and steel that would go into cans you would buy in the store, allow all that to go into the war effort. Ohioans grew more than a million victory gardens in the state, and all that food had to be preserved. The scale and scope of canning had been steadily increasing for decades, especially with the introduction of pressure canners, the mechanization of the glass jar making process, which made jars more, uh, uh, much less expensive, and scientific experimentation that set standards for the amount of time th of each uh, food that was safe for each food. One immediately grasped just how thoroughly canning all sorts of food had become ingrained in the American household in the canning budget that Snow uh, sets aside. Snow explains that one should can between 80 to 120 quarts of food for each family member. Divide it up in lots of green and yellow vegetables, 30 to 45 quarts, tomatoes, 20 to 30 quarts, fruit, 30 to 45 quarts, and meat, 10 quarts. 
and includes a helpful accompanying chart converting raw measures to canned quantities. For a family of four, about the average size of a family at the time, this budget could mean canning close to 500 quarts of food every year. The weeks that this would entail, working over batches of boiling water for hours on end in the heat of the late summer and all in the days before air conditioning should give every one of you a renewed respect for the efforts of American homemakers in World War II. Uh, people who were not in uniform also found many other ways to serve. When the war started, Ohio Governor John Bricker authorized the creation of the 2,200 member State Guard to replace the National Guard. Uh, there was also the Civil uh, Defense Administration, uh, the Council uh, that, uh, the, the, the State Defense Council, which uh, oversaw war production, agricultural production, labor, training, mobilization. You had civil defense wardens, of course, who would enforce wartime restrictions and coordinate activities. Uh, and federal agencies helped with a massive advertising and propaganda campaign to enlist every citizen in the fight, especially women maintaining the home as husbands and sons were off to war. I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to thank the MAPS Museum for I, I, a lot of these images I actually got there from one of my visits. So uh, since we have some, some people representing the MAPS Museum, I appreciate that. Propaganda posters uh, abounded and were almost impossible to avoid. Uh, some encouraged behavior that supported the war effort, like planting victory gardens or buying war bonds. War bond drives touched the lives of most families throughout the war. If the posters didn't convince you, you could still be swayed by jingles on the radio, and if that didn't work, uh, you could be hit up again when you went to the movies that night by film stars and even Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, who were selling you on buying war bonds in the trailer before the feature mo movie that you saw. And here, too, even children could get involved. If you did not have enough cash to buy an entire war bond, you could buy war stamps for as little as 10 cents. Yes, you did, yeah, the school children were enlisted this, and then you pasted all these stamps in a booklet, which, when it got full, it allowed you to cash in, usually for a Series E war bond, $18.75 in war stamps that get you a $25 bond that would mature in 10 years. Uh, other posters discouraged behaviors that inhibited the war effort. The government stressed conservation of resources and materials with titles like waste helps the enemy. Uh, there's a nice, that's very clever use of these things to get a, get a Hitler-y uh, look to those things. And of course, one of the most famous is when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler, encouraging um, uh, carpooling. It also warned against things that might compromise security, domestic tranquility, or production. Loose lips might sink ships, imply dire consequences if a person divulged information in casual conversation that might be useful to the enemy. The middle poster here reminds inv individuals that foreign propaganda and defeatist or anti-government messages work for the enemy by draining morale and disrupting harmony among Americans of different ethnicities and creeds. And many workplaces hung posters telling workers that slacking off on the job helped the enemy. So everyone was expected to be pitching in, no matter who they were or even how old. One activity that even children could participate in was the collection of materials for recycling into war material. Fat and grease were carefully collected from cooking and taken to collection centers. Rubber was gathered and recycled. But the biggest uh, effort of this kind were usually the large scrap metal drives. These were community events uh, replete with parades and celebrities. Uh, here we have popular film star of the time, Rita Hayworth, uh, bragging that she had given her car bunker, bumper to the war effort. Akron had a major uh, victory uh, scrap yard at the corner of East Exchange and Carroll Street. You can see St. Bernard's Church there in the background there which served as a clearinghouse for scrap metal collection uh, throughout the city. Furthermore, each local community staged their own scrap drives, often using local school children to take wagons around the neighborhood to collect material from their neighbors, usually in the forms of tin or aluminum cans, old pots and pans. But you also had larger items fueling these scrap drives. Here we have some Barberton kids proudly displaying bed springs, tire rims, mailboxes, 55-gallon drums, and large metal poles, among other things. Now granted, these campaigns were decidedly not politically correct. 
uh, in contemporary terms, but in this way they were not much different from much of the rest of the propaganda that home front residents of Akron could see during the war. Of the major allied powers, the United States was quite fortunate not to have a great deal of fighting and destruction on its home soil. But this is not to say that the country did not share its own great struggles with loss. Of all the ever-present reminders of the war, none were more sobering than the gold star flags that hung in the windows of homes belonging to those who had lost a family member during the war. These along with the casualty list printed in newspapers, never let the gravity of the war stray too far from people's minds. Unlike some aspects of the home front, like rationing and scrap drives, it was this part of the war that would continue to affect the lives of Akron residents for decades afterward. Akron's, Akronites celebrated Victory in Europe Day on May 8, 1945, and Victory in Japan Day on August 14th. With the Great Depression and World War II finally over, they could return to something approaching a normal life. But after so much tumult and change, what did that mean? Ohio had become an urban and industrial state, and the war had brought greater federal presence to the lives of all Ohioans. By 1945, the state had recovered from the Depression, and its economy looked strong. Cities hummed, and farms were once again prosperous. Like the nation itself, Ohio stood on the verge of a new wave of economic growth and suburban expansion that would define much of the post-war years. The good life would come for many, but as Rosie the rubber worker and those African-American employees demonstrated, the war also brought seeds of change that would continue to affect American society and the life in Akron for years to come. Any uh, questions? Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, the, the Lend-Lease program that the United States, not only did they do all the United States military, they, they kept the British afloat, they supplied the Russians with all their, um, uh, most of their, not the tanks so much, but the, a lot of the other material. Yeah, so the United States was not just producing for the United States, they were the arsenal of democracy, as uh, Franklin Roosevelt said. Yeah, oftentimes uh, those war industries, and, and sometimes it was, uh, you, you wouldn't get a break for, for a month. Do you have a figure on how many Akronites lost their lives? I was trying to find that, and I could not find uh, that number. Uh, I, like I said, I, I found that you had 31,000 people who uh, enlisted in Akron. Uh, it was, um, it, I mean, if the, if the average uh, fatality rate uh, obtains, then that would mean about 3,000 uh, Akronites lost their lives. But I, I do not have that. I tried really hard to find that data. I'm sorry. I also want to mention there were young kids like my stock. We worked seven days a week. Go to school and work. Yeah. Every day of the week. No, it was, uh, they mobilized everybody, everybody who could be mobilized. Your numbers, you talk about uh huh. Well, for instance, the enlistment numbers is pretty much Summit County, I think. I mean, people enlisting in Akron would include people enlisting from other parts of Summit County, maybe Stark and Trumbull and stuff like that. Uh, so that 31,000 enlistment, uh, that is really kind of uh, a broader kind of Summit County thing. But some of those other numbers were uh, just, uh, just, just for Akron, yeah. You were talking about tires, how hard it was to get tires. Well, I remember the trailers that the trucks pulled in the Akron area loaded with spare, uh, scrap tires, but they were riding on solid steel wheels that had just a bead of rubber around them. Oh my gosh. About two inches thick. That's a rough ride. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the trailers were at an angle because they were much lower than they should have been. Yeah, they had full tires. Wow. So even the, even the trucks taking the, the spare tires could not get tires. Right. Oh, you were at, somebody asked about the war dead. Aren't there all the names on Memorial Hall? A lot of the names, I'm not sure that's everybody from Akron. Um, uh, um, and if, but Memorial Hall in, 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 on the University of Akron campus, that's why it's called uh, Memorial Hall. Um, 
I, I, I think they just took, that, that might have included some people from outside Akron itself. It might have included Cuyahoga Falls and, and other places. I think we had another back here. Wow. Yes. Eight minutes. 4,808 Corsairs. <laughs> That's incredible. The factory was next to the air dock. Oh, yeah, I, I forgot. Uh, somebody very helpfully brought in some, uh, some um, photographs here. These are, and you can talk to them afterwards. This is an example of a Corsair in flight. Here's one. She, he says it's a composite, but it's nice because it has the Corsairs flying up here and then the air dock down below there. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's a nice, uh, nice image. And then uh, there were actually a few kind of advanced Corsairs uh, that had much more powerful Pratt & Whitney engine, uh, but they, never, uh, they were developed in 1945 and never actually saw combat. So if anyone wants to see these things, I recommend you uh, seeing this gentleman afterwards. It was, it was a... Uh, when those engines cut out, they dropped like rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had to... Uh, you could heal, heal a lot of anecdotal stuff, but one of, one of the things I heard from somebody who, I think he's 88 now, from Akron originally, he worked for the railroad, his dad worked for the railroad, he said you, you couldn't leave the railroad to go to another job because it was so vital for troop movement through Akron. And not just troops, I mean supplies as well, yeah. yeah. And, and also, I don't know, but I may have been the youngest person to ever work at Goodyear Aircraft because my mom was carrying me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get paid? Uh, <laughs> you should sue for back wages. And in Neal's building, World War II, had people volunteer at night to watch for airplanes for air attack. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was uh, that was one of the things that is a civil defense, and they, they would give these charts which have like the silhouettes of all these different kinds of aircraft. Now, if you have a German or Japanese aircraft flying over Akron, Ohio, I think the war's over, you know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I actually had a great aunt who, uh, who every night went out, and she lived in Normal, Illinois, and just prowled the skies with her binoculars looking for German <laughs> aircraft. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, submarines uh, actually torpedo a lot of uh, ships right off the coast of the United States. If you think of the EPA today, they try to control the pollution and so forth of the air. I remember going down to Akron and they were going through the rubber area, the strong smell, the ozone and so forth. They say it melt the nylons right off your legs. Oh, I, I, you know, even in the late 1970s, early 1980s. <laughs> I, re I remember I went to school at Kent State, and I remember driving, you know, to and from. I I could smell Akron sometimes before I was there. Yeah. And then to top it off, you get into Akron, and then you get into Quaker Oats area, and now you got the smell of. Now that I liked, and I like the smell of the Wonder Bread plant there. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I worked at City Hospital in the '70s, and at that point in time, we still didn't have air conditioning. <sighs> we still didn't have um, screens on our windows. But it was so hot in there, you'd open the windows and all that would come in. <laughs> Which is worse. Like that was like, oh. If you want to see a B-26, uh, maps just restore to B-26. Oh, yes, that was another thing I wanted to mention. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, the Maps Air Museum, we have some people here. I would strongly encourage you to go visit that if you have not yet. They have one of the few remaining marauders. And, uh, of all the thousands of marauders that were ever made, how many are still around? About 18 marauders still exist, and they have one of them. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in this, I, I strongly encourage you to uh, to visit the the maps here. It's not that far from here. So. Mm. And I mean, it was a fight to get money from them. It was their plane, but they didn't want to pay for 
still here in Akron. Uh, and yes, we have a pancake breakfast this coming Sunday, the 25th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it's like getting uh, free breakfast. So, it's a go. Thank you.